Hello everyone, I'm Steve, and this is Kerbal Space Program, in a new series called Departing for Duna. This is Episode 2. We last left off after we'd completed our burn at our solar periapsis, extending our apoapsis until we got an encounter with Duna. We will now coast for around three months until we reach about halfway to our destination, where we will make a very small burn, in order to move our encounter with Duna a little bit closer to its surface. Now you'll notice that we're not too worried about exactly where we're burning, but we are concerned with exactly how much we're burning. When you're out this far from your destination, being a little early or late on your burn won't matter much, but thrusting a little too much, or too little, will cause drastic differences in your trajectory compared to where you're trying to go. This, of course, is the opposite of how things work out if, say, you're orbiting Duna close in. In that case, when you burn, it becomes much more important, the timing. But small differences in how much delta V you use becomes less of a difference maker. The closer we can get when we pass by Duna, without actually entering the atmosphere, the more efficient it is for us to slow ourselves down from interplanetary speed to orbital speed. What we want is to put ourselves about 1,600,000 meters above the surface. This will give us an orbital period of about 9 hours which will allow us good coverage of all of Duna without being too far away or even possibly getting so far out that we put ourselves in danger of mucking about in Ike's orbit. Of course, we could probably be even outside of Ike's orbit because of the satellites we're carrying. That's right. This rocket contains three brand new RA-100 relay dishes, which will form our new communications network. Now you'll notice that as we get above Duna's orbit, Duna actually begins to catch up with us, and we're getting close. Ah, and here is Duna. The Kerbals, of course, have only seen the planet through their telescopes thus far, though they've gone to Minmus and the Moon. They have not ventured outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence yet. So you can imagine they are all huddled around the control center on Kerbin right now, looking at the new images coming through in this rocket. They're keen to see their new home, and the scientists must gather as much information as they can, as quickly as they can, to begin planning their next mission. As we get close to our Duna periapsis, we point toward our target marker and toward the retrograde direction. We will begin our burn, which will slow us down from interplanetary speeds of over 1,000 meters per second, to a more manageable speed that will allow us to get into orbit around Duna. And now we're close. We begin our countdown. Three, two, one, and here we begin our burn. The Kerbals have sent this rocket with a nuclear engine. What the nerve engine lacks in thrust to weight ratio, it makes up for in efficiency. It's not going to get you off the ground, especially through an atmosphere. But up here, having to carry less fuel for a more efficient engine means more delta V. And more delta V means more space more science, and more fun. Here you can see that as we continue to burn in the retrograde direction, our curve around Duna becomes more and more pronounced, with the end goal being to actually get into a stable orbit. To equally space our satellites, we perform a little trick in our orbit. We are going to have each of these satellites have an orbital period of exactly nine hours. So with our carrier rocket, we keep our apoapsis where it is, but we drop our periapsis until our orbital period is six hours. Then, each time we go around and hit apoapsis, we release a satellite, and that satellite then fires its thrusters in the prograde direction to increase its orbit back to circular until it's back in an orbit whose period is nine hours. So you will see our periapsis here continue to drop, as we go for right around six hours, which in Kerbal time is a day. Once we get there, we can release our first satellite. This is where the fun begins. Now as we tilt our rocket upwards, we aim our first satellite into the general prograde direction. We check that everything's in order, and then we decouple. Now, you can see it would have been a good idea to turn down the power on those decouplers. They really shoot the satellite out, spinning away. But no matter, we've actually given ourselves a little free thrust into the prograde direction. 
We'll get a handle on this. Now it only has the probe as a reaction wheel, so it takes a few seconds to slow down our spin. But we get it pointed into the prograde direction, and then we get our satellite ready for use. We extend those photovoltaic panels, check that our batteries are working, and then we get ready to fire those little spider liquid fuel engines. And now we're pointed about at the prograde, and we begin. As we begin to burn in the prograde direction, we again rise our periapsis back up, and we put ourselves back into a mostly circular orbit. The important thing we're watching for is that the orbital period is as close to nine hours as we can get it. Now the way you usually create a relay network is you equally space your satellites around the planet or moon, each in the same plane with the same orbit. If you have three satellites, like we do now, then you're going to put them each a third of an orbit away from each other. This way, no matter where you are on the ground on Duna, you will always have a line of sight on at least one satellite. And that satellite always had a line of sight to another satellite which can see Kerbin, or a line of sight on Kerbin itself. So we have communications with the home planet no matter where we are. Now as you'll see, our satellites become spaced exactly a third away from the one in front and the one behind. Now, if you really wanted to be precise, you'd make sure each satellite has a matching apoapsis and periapsis, and that their orbits are as circular as possible. But we're not going to worry about that as much. What we really need to worry about for this mission is the orbital period. If our satellites have minor variations in their orbits, and how close and far they are from one another, but their orbital periods are exactly the same timing, that means that they will con they will keep the configuration that they are from one another for a very long time. And their orbits won't degrade, they won't get closer to one another, and they won't get farther. Now you can see we've just launched the second of our three satellites here from our craft. This is the first craft we've launched toward Kerbal's future home. And once we get these satellites into orbit, any other Kerbals and craft on and around the surface will always have a line of communication back to Kerbin. It's the first of a number of important steps toward colonizing the Red Planet. Yes, the Kerbos have unfortunately discovered an asteroid heading directly toward their lovely planet of Kerbin. The scientists predict that the outcome won't be good for the Kerbin system, to say the least. They do have time before this happens, but they certainly need to begin looking for a new place to call home, and the Kerbos have decided that Duna looks like a wonderful new spot. Satellite 2 has now finished its burn and is in a 9-hour orbital period orbit. It turns toward Duna. Once we get these satellites into orbit, the real planning begins. The Kerbals will need to create bigger and better rockets than they've so far created. They will need ships that can carry themselves, that can carry resources, that can carry the places that they're going to live in on Duna. And of course, they will need all types of space stations to orbit and study the planet from above, ships to get Kerbals from the stations down to the surface and back again, and all manner of rovers to drive around the surface in order to explore, do science, and race each other for who gets the last snacks. Though the asteroid coming toward Kerbin is scary, it has finally pressed the Kerbals into action to achieve their destiny. Somewhere deep in their Kerbal hearts, they've known all along that they were bound for other worlds, for other systems, and for the stars. So as their third satellite launches, they're looking on the bright side, as they take their first steps to fulfilling their destiny. Here the Kerbals expand the solar panels on relay satellite number three, and they will repeat the procedure of getting this dish into an orbit with a period of nine hours. As long as all of these satellites have the exact same orbital period, they should hold their position for a very long time. If the Kerbals are lucky, these satellites will watch from above, as Duna transforms from a barren red wasteland into a populated and terraformed place that all Kerbals would be proud of. They will continue to send their signals from Duna to Kerbin and back again, until they are no longer needed as a relay to the home planet when Duna becomes the home planet. Hopefully then, these satellites will link Duna and other planets. Now that we have our satellites in orbit, our carrier rocket does not have any real use anymore. So the Kerbals have decided to send it to Duna's surface. 
They don't want to leave space junk floating around their new home, and it will also give them a chance to take some pictures up close of the surface before the rocket crashes. As the craft falls, Duna's thin atmosphere licks at the solar panels and the engines, giving the Kerbals back home a show. Maybe the boys and girls in the lab can get some extra information with these up-close pictures. Maybe some extra juicy science. And there it is. The first surface pictures of Duna have come back to Kerbin, and the Kerbins marvel at the new place they will begin to colonize. That, in the next episode of Departing for Duna.